Can you please spell your name for me and explain your area of expertise? Okay, my name is Patrick Muffler. And the last name is M-U-F-F-L-E-R, just like what's under a car. It's an old German name. We've traced it back to about 1730, and I'm not going to tell you what it means. The uh, <coughs> I've uh, worked for the Geological Survey since I was a freshman in college in 1955 and uh, started full-time here in Menlo Park in January of 1962 where I was uh, affiliated with the Alaskan Geology Branch and was working in Southeast Alaska with three other geologists. Uh, I had a congenital hip problem and it got worse in Alaska so I got out of that kind of Boy Scout work and was fortunate enough to stumble into hot spring work with my uh, mentor, Don White, Donald E. White, whom you'll be hearing a lot about over the next day. Um, we got started working on the Salton Sea geothermal system in Southern California, and then kind of out of the blue, uh, uh, NASA decided that they wanted to use Yellowstone as a ground truth site for a lot of their space exploration stuff. And they came to the Geological Survey and provided the Geological Survey with then what was a big hunk of money and allowed a whole set of investigations to develop up there. Everything from regional geologic mapping down to very detailed studies of the hot spring areas. And Don got immediately involved in that. Uh, Bob Fournier had already worked in Yellowstone, uh, consulting through the Park Service on Barrel Spring and in doing uh, silica solubility work with uh, Dr. Morey in Washington. And Bob and Don were kind of the nucleus and the leaders of our group in Yellowstone. And then Alfred Truesdell and I were the, the junior people up there trying to find out what we could do that hadn't already been done by these geothermal gods. Um, <clears throat> so we, uh, we had a, a uh, our, our first endeavor up there was mainly the first year in 1965 when we basically uh, went up there, did some geologic mapping in the hot spring areas, looked around, got a, got, got a feel for things. Um, and of course it was based, what we did in 66, which was when the drilling campaign started, was it was based on the uh, wireline drilling that Don had done at Steamboat Springs in Nevada, which had been a very successful endeavor looking at the physical properties in the upper part of hot spring systems. Well, our Yellowstone work was predicated upon that example. So we uh, developed a, a two-year uh, diamond drilling program up there, which is really the cornerstone of the work that we did in Yellowstone. The cornerstone in the sense that it not only provided us with uh, uh, accurate temperature and pressure measurements in the upper part of the hot spring systems, but also provided us with drill core looking at what the water had actually done to the rocks, and it provided us with fluid samples at controlled temperatures and pressures, and a whole raft of other collateral data that made the endeavor, I think, truly unique, and a real tribute to, to Don White's vision in, in leading it and organizing it. Was there any resistance to scientific drilling in Yellowstone? Uh, I'm sure there must have been some. Uh, we had great support from the Park Service staff, particularly John Good, the chief naturalist. I don't believe we ever had a written agreement with Yellowstone. Uh, I think it was just word of mouth. Uh, we had good support all around. There were all around. There were certain uh, individuals, certain district rangers who in the park who clearly were. Uh, uh, had some reluctance, and most of it had to do with, with surface um, scars. And this was particularly the case at the, the drill hole we drilled at Sulphur Cauldron, which it was a really rainy spring. We got the drill rig stuck in the mud. We got the flatbed truck stuck in the mud over at the next drill hole. We had to winch him out, 
and it left uh, uh, a heck of a mess. And that upset at least one ranger. But in terms of significant uh, uh, controversy, I don't recall any whatsoever. Now, obviously, right now, if we were to go in and do that sort of drilling project in Yellowstone, writing the environmental impact statement would be a century-long process if it ever happened. Mm -hmm. I think we are just under everybody's radar screen at that time. Why was NASA interested in Yellowstone? I don't remember the details of their analysis, but fundamentally it was just they were using Yellowstone as an example of what they might find on some other planet at that time. And so they said, okay, we're going to look at it from space, see what we can see from space, and then look at it on the ground and compare the two and see how these two images, if you will, merge. What was the principal focus of your research? I was for focused entirely on the hydrothermal systems, although we did interact extensively with Bob Christensen in terms of the the geologic mapping, particularly where it got into the hot spring areas. Uh, we actually found uh, the uh, uh, Lava Creek tuff first in one of the drill holes in, in Rabbit Creek. We didn't even know it existed in, in that part of the world. And that led to a very interesting uh, interaction between me and Don White. The Don came up and, and uh, I said that, you know, we found this ash flow tuff in there and that I'd taken it down and showed it to Bob Christensen and he'd agreed that it was ash flow tuff and Don said it couldn't possibly be. And this, this darn near led to blows that, uh, I mean, he was just adamant that it couldn't possibly be ash flow tuff and it did indeed turn out to be and everything worked out okay, but it was uh, one of the, it wasn't all sweetness and light. What was the geologic understanding of Yellowstone when you began working there? It was only a few years before that, that it, Joe Boyd had recognized that indeed it was a caldera there that basically was filled with uh, rhyolites. Nobody else had ever recognized this. And of course then Bob Christensen went in there and mapped it in detail and showed that not only there was just the one caldera, there are actually three major calderas separated by about 600,000 years between each one. So our, our geologic knowledge of it was really predicated on the work of very early surveys that had been done, uh, the Hayden survey, some work, a lot of work that Alan and Day did on hot spring work. But the first really modern geologic studies were Joe Boyd's and then Bob Christensen and his colleagues. Uh, and then the peripheral studies on the Paleozoic rocks and Mesozoic rocks by people like Harry Smeads and Ed Ruppel and uh, a batch of others. And then at the same time, <coughs> at the same time, we had a group looking very carefully at the glacial history. Uh, of that, led by Jerry Richmond with Ken Pierce and Harry Waldrop on it. So it was quite a uh, uh, diverse group of USGS scientists who were involved. I haven't mentioned all of them by any means. And um, uh, we were uh, fortunate in being very well supported by the uh, management of the Geological Survey at that time. This. Uh, um, this mega project got uh, exceptionally uh, good support all the way up the line. A real criti critical person was a branch chief by the name of Art Campbell in Denver, whom we didn't work for, but was clearly an uh, instrumental person in making the work of people like Christensen and Rupel and Smeeds possible. Describe working with your colleagues on Yellowstone topics. Well, we had a lot of visitors up there. We had people coming through all the time. And in fact, as I go back through my field notes, I'm amazed at some of the people that I, I, I actually showed around up there that I had completely and totally forgotten. We had a lot of uh, interaction, not only among the four of us, but uh, you know, we'd get down and, and uh, stop in and see Bob Christensen every time we could. Uh, He's always been kind of a geological god to me, so it was always fun to go down and see him. And, and there was a, 
not a formal uh, network, but you just made every opportunity you could to, to talk to people. Uh, you didn't use the phone that much. A lot of letters. Back then, it's amazing how uh, communication and interaction was indeed by typewritten letter. Tell the story of the Lava Creek Tough and your mentor, Don White. Well, first of all, the, the context of this, this was a disagreement with Don, but you do have disagreements with your close colleagues. And I want to be sure that I'm absolutely explicit that Don White was my mentor. He got me into geothermal energy. He got me started on the Salton Sea area, which was the first major thing I did in my career. He got me involved in Yellowstone. He supported me in, in all of the subsequent work I did. In, in geothermal energy and you know, without Don White I would be Lord knows where at the moment. Um, <clears throat> but this particular one that uh, I was up there on uh, the, the, one of the drill holes and we found this rock which I thought was a ash flow tuff, an ignimbrite if you will. So I, knowing Christensen was down at Flag Ranch near the Tetons, I drove down there with it and I showed it to Chris, and I said, Chris, I think this is an ash flow tuff. And Chris said, yes, it is. So we were quite excited about this because of its structural position. This was well within the major caldera there, and you think of a caldera as a subsidence structure, but to see the stuff that had subsided somehow getting pushed up near the surface was uh, uh, statistically uh, impossible, particularly since it never is exposed at the surface there. In other words, the only exposure of this particular rock that we yet ever found was in the drill hole. And so we actually went in with Bob Christensen and we got a bunch of, with some rangers to go with this and some workers from the Old Faithful Inn to go into this area and blitz it in terms of looking for ash flow tough. The reason we did it with a great huge group of people is this country was just rife with grizzly bears. We were drilling at a dump, and at that time the dumps were just open things sitting in the park, and the grizzly bears came in every night and they, sh they uh, uh, slurped up all of the garbage that came, and of course you walked around the area and it was just full of, of droppings of blue plastic bags and glass and what have you. You could understand why the grizzly bears were very unhappy people. And uh, so we went in there with bells and whistles and everybody screaming and yelling to basically try and be safe while we're in there because no way w was either I or Bob Christensen going to go map in there individually. I mean, we would have been dead meat. And so that was the result of it. We so we were left with this occurrence in the drill hole, which is an improbable situation. But once we looked at the whole drill hole carefully, looked at the thin sections, did the petrography on it, and any question. It just was, you know, Don came up and he didn't believe it and he got very mad and uh, it blew over. That was just life. Why did NASA care about your hydrothermal work? Well, the, Jake's question was the, your question, excuse me, was, was did NASA pay for the drilling? And to my knowledge, they did pay for the drilling. They were interested in what was the nature of the hydrothermal systems to understand them such that if they saw certain things at the surface on another planet, they would have some idea as to what they meant other than just at the very top of the surface. And the other question was, uh, what did the survey kick into this, salaries? I would assume the survey just paid our salaries, but I don't know. I was a very junior uh, geologist at that time, and I didn't worry about any of that bureaucratic stuff. Was it exciting to work in Yellowstone? Oh, it was spectacularly exciting. First of all, to visit it, not just as a tourist, which I had done before, but to actually have some raison d'etre for doing things, looking at hot springs, uh, 
walking around with people like Bob and Don and learning what they did, what they had done up there, what their knowledge of hot springs was. And of course, Yellowstone is the premier hot spring area of the world. I mean, any feature that you want to see in a hot spring, you're going to see at Yellowstone and a lot more that never occur anywhere else. So it was, uh, uh, you were just thrown into a, a geologist heaven up there. There were just so many things to do and look at and our interest went in so many different directions uh, among the four of us. We were not clones up there by any stretch of the imagination. That, of course, Bob and Alfred were very much involved in the, in the water chemistry. I got involved in the nature of the rock alteration. Uh, we got involved, uh, I got involved in the geophysics up there, working with Adel Zodi in, in Denver. Uh, Dick Blank was working up there, and we were using uh, something called AFMAG, which I couldn't tell you what it is anymore, but it, we were trying to look at the subsurface aspects of the uh, hot spring areas with uh, detailed uh, magnetic surveys, if you will. It was a very exciting, stimulating time, and we were going in, in 65 different directions. How did the theory of plate tectonics developing in the 60s affect your work at that time? At that time, it impacted it very, very little because this was in the middle of the continent, if you will. People hadn't really yet focused on, for example, the, the track up the eastern Snake River Plain to Yellowstone. Uh, they were still busy looking at defining what subduction zones and spreading ridges were and the major tectonic features. And we were just in the middle of a plate. And plate tectonics really didn't uh, enter much into our thinking. Now, this may have a very different uh, answer to that story. He may have been thinking about, well, you know, why do you have this major volcanic anomaly sitting in the middle of the plate here? And that's, of course, consumed people for, for generations since. But as far as I'm concerned, I was focused on the hot spring phenomenon in the upper few hundred feet of the, the, uh, the few hundred feet below the surface. Have you examined the question of hydrothermal explosions in Yellowstone? Well, I was aware of hydrothermal explosions because Don White studied a major hydrothermal explosion at Lake City in northeastern California, Surprise Valley. I believe it was in 1955. And basically, this innocuous hot spring area in the middle of the night went up in the air and scattered itself all over the landscape. And Don got up there a little while later and wrote a, a very interesting paper in the Bulletin of the Geological Society of America on that. But, um, and that was kind of in the back of his mind and my mind when we went up there. But then we, we started finding these crater-like features in the hot spring areas, particularly something called Pocket Basin, which is in Lower Geyser Basin, which is oh, something like three quarters of a mile in diameter or half a mile by three quarters, I forget the details. And it turned out, to make a long story short, that this turned out to be the classic hydrothermal explosion feature. Hydrothermal explosion feature meaning that the, the upper part of a hot spring system that is everywhere at the boiling point becomes uh, unstable for a variety of different reasons and basically explodes. No magmas involved. It's not like there's, it's not a, a, a explosion like the phreatomagmatic explosions they get in Hawaii. This is just a, an inevitable happening at, uh, in the upper part of a hydrothermal system where the temperatures along the boiling point curve are increasing very rapidly with depth. And of course, that creates a very unstable situation. Um, it turns out that we found a number of these things that seem to have happened at about the time of deglaciation up there. So we reasoned in a paper that Don and I and Alfred wrote, um, we reasoned that basically you had a very rapid uh, uh, decrease in pressure on the hydrothermal system owing to the draining of a lake impounded by glaciers, by Yokelalp, if you will. And the fact that the lake went from 
such and such a level to such and such a level down here with the hot spring underneath it. The hot spring at that time then became way above the boiling point curve and simply exploded. And this seems to have been a, a pervasive phenomenon, not only in the geyser basins, but also over at Lake, uh, been worked on extensively by other, other scientists subsequent to our work. Well, we got involved in that, and that was probably the most interesting and exciting paper I've ever written. I mean, it was just, you couldn't wait to come to work to work on that paper. You were so excited about the, the uh, nature of the, the stuff you found, and it was pretty new stuff, too. And you could document a lot of it. I mean, you, you, could, you could show that the fragments in the hydrothermal explosion breccia were hydrothermally altered rock. They weren't, you know, it, it all made sense, and it was great fun. Then Alfred did a, a lot of really neat analytical work on it that, that built, built into it. So that was the thing. And of course, that's led to uh, an analysis currently going on. Of, okay, now what, what is the uh, nature of the hazards at Yellowstone? And I think most of us would agree that uh, one of the more likely happenings is uh, our hydrothermal explosions for various purposes. We've had them at Black Sand Basin, and we've had them over at, uh, over at Lake in that area, and they're, they're certainly a lot more likely than the, than the uh, super volcano sort of thing that gets all the media attention. Were you worried about pressure releases during drilling? You bet. Uh, we had the experience of a guy by the name of Clarence Fenner from the Carnegie Institution that had drilled several holes in the geyser basins in 1929. And one in Yellowstone in particular, uh, they really had problems with. And there's some wonderful pictures of here's this old wood drilling platform with just steam coming out all around it. And there's a wonderful quote from Clarence Fenner there that he was describing a particular series of events where steam started coming out. And, and Fenner's comment was, and the driller became apprehensive. <laughs> well, definitely got our attention. And uh, we went in there with our eyes open that there was a real potential. We were drilling into systems which had uh, the potential of exploding both through the drilling pipe itself, but also if we didn't case them properly and didn't drill the well properly around the drill hole. That was in the back of our minds. Fortunately, we didn't have to write an environmental impact statement, but it's not like we were neglecting it. And indeed, we learned as we earned on this one that we had a wonderful drilling crew from Sprague and Henwood particularly a guy by the name of Max Kingsley and his helper, Lem Haynes. And these guys just became absolute pros at working at drilling in these high temperature situations. We developed equipment on the fly to, to uh, uh, be able to, for example, when you got at very high temperatures and pressures, you, you, the water inside, the, these were water-cooled uh, uh, drill rods, the water inside was over the boiling temperature. So if you had to add another rod to the drill string, you basically had to erupt the water out of the drill string, add the rod, but you didn't want to have the, the water keep coming up through the drill bit, so we developed a one-way valve that went in down there. And that, I would say, was fabricated on the fly. We said, we need this, and either Sprague and Henwood developed it or, or Bob developed it back here. And there was all sorts of these, these things. And there's, it became very routine, particularly drilling at the last Norris hole, where you, just, you expected the drill rods to produce this spectacular eruption every time you, you pulled core, every time you added a section of rod, or every time you did anything. Now, the, the really dicey one was at uh, the second hole we drilled, where we found that the, the nipple, the, the, the bit of pipe that attached the valve to the casing had developed a crack in it. I remember Don White down on his hands and knees looking at that and finding that crack. Well, 
how do you fix that? Basically, what they designed was a wood plug, which they put on the drill string, put it down, crammed it into the casing down there, unscrewed it, pulled out the drill string, removed the valve, removed the offending cracked nipple, put, the crack, put a new nipple back on, put the valve back on, and then, shut the, and then pulled the wood plug and shut the valve. I think I've got that right. But that was, uh, regardless of the details of that, it was a exciting business. And when, you, when we were drilling up there, it wasn't that we just had the two, two drillers sitting up on the rig. We were up there horsing around drill pipe, uh, I mean, I mean, it was other duties as assigned commensurate with abilities. And if I'm not mistaken, Bob cracked a rib up on there, hunting, uh, hauling around drill pipe at one time. And of course, Don White was up there. He had a bad hip. I was up there. I had a bad hip. And Alfred was up there with a bad ankle. So it was, it was really a, but it was a very effective. Uh, team collaboration with the drillers. There's another guy, Buddy Tawney, that was involved also. That was uh, pretty darn exciting and, and very rewarding for everybody concerned and ultimately very, very successful. Okay. Do you remember the first hole you drilled? Oh, yeah. Well, tell us about that. Oh, you bet. It was the Y1 out at, uh, at a Whisker, Whistler Geyser in, in, in uh, Black Sand Basin. And what we, well, I remember drilling it, and I remember it was the first one where we were in high temperatures, and we learned a lot, and it was successful. And we set up a water stage recorder on Whistle Geyser, which is right next to it. We were able to demonstrate the effect of the drilling on the geyser, and uh, it was a, a, a good scientific project. I remember it in great part because it was very snowy. This was in April of 1967 and I have a wonderful picture of the phone booth at Old Faithful with the snow level about five feet above the top of the phone booth. And I remember calling my wife from there and she telling me that she had bought a house. Why drill in April? Well, because uh, you, the places that were very exposed to tourists you wanted to drill in the very early spring or the late fall to the extent weather would allow you. The last thing you wanted to do was to be drilling at Whistle Geyser or Black Sand Basin in the middle of summer. It just would not have worked. And even then you still had a lot of interaction with tourists uh, where we were drilling in the parking lot at Norris Geyser Basin and virtually one of us at all times was talking to somebody who had stopped and wanted to know what we were doing. It just, it was an inevitable uh, distraction of resources. Did you look for magmatic evidence in the drill materials? No, not the drilled materials, but in the materials that were expelled from these craters. The craters were obvious. The question was, were they related to a magmatic event or were they strictly the explosion of the upper part of a hydrothermal system. And the default explanation would be magma. So we looked very, very careful, for very, very carefully for any evidence of this and found none. And most people were not aware of the fact that uh, boiling at the surface at Yellowstone was, say, about 91 degrees Celsius. But the boiling temperature increases very, very quickly with depth uh, along the boiling point curve. And that provides a mechanism for explosion, which most people, other than uh, people like Bob Fournier, were, were simply not aware of. In fact, I probably got that idea uh, from Bob and Don. They were fully aware of the importance of the boiling point curve in the upper part of hydrothermal systems. And it was just a step from that to visualize that as a mechanism for this explosion. And in fact, if you went back, you probably find it's inherent in half a dozen papers Don White wrote. They're very, very new things. 
There's a one little vignette about new things that Alfred and I were so excited about the fact that we found that these big flats in Lower Geyser Basin were actually not alluvium, as some of our colleagues had mapped 10 or 15 years before, but were actually nothing but diatoms. They were 10, 15, 18 feet of diatom mud. And we thought this was a wonderful discovery. Made sense, all the high silica water coming out, the diatoms love to live there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we had roughed out a paper we were going to write, and then I had the brains to go back and look at the literature and found out that Harvey Walter Weed had actually published that in 1868 or 1886 or something like that. There's so very the little that's new under the sun. <laughs> so the diatoms were in the hydrothermal system, or were they in the No, no, no. Type no. They, the waters coming out of the hydrothermal systems, when they went over the silica terraces, they evaporated, if you will, or deposited the hard silica that makes up the geyser cones in the silica terraces. But then as the water cools, it drifts down into these broad flats. They're called fountain flats in this particular case. And the, the diatoms love high silica water. The water's nice and cold by the time it gets there. It's an absolutely ideal environment for diatoms to flourish. And they do. Were there any epiphanies in studying Yellowstone? Well, the light bulb obviously went off with all of us with respect to the hydrothermal explosion features. Um, I remember um, a rather unimportant time when the light bulb went off for me that we were talking about, you know, what were going to be the dangers when we moved on to drilling at Norris, because we were all concerned about drilling at Norris, because that's where Finner had had all the problems. So I was staying in a cabin at Old Faithful, and I, I just reading Fenner's stuff in great detail, and I finally tumbled to some of the temperatures and pressures that he'd recorded. And I went charging over to Don's cabin and said, Don, do you realize what, what Fenner's data shows here? He says, yes. <laughs> like, you know, okay, you finally figured it out, kid. <laughs> so there was lots of uh, epiphanies of, if you will, greater or lesser. One of the real epiphanies that developed through the whole thing that Bob will talk about is how he and Alfred were able to develop these number of techniques to look at the chemical composition of waters and predict what the reservoir temperature was at depth. Overall, that was a not so much an epiphany as a development of knowledge that had tremendous impact in the whole geothermal industry. Describe some of the hydrothermal work. Uh, we were drilling in the very shallow areas of geothermal systems. We were not drilling at commercial geothermal depths, say 10,000 feet. But we were drilling at uh, uh, and seeing phenomenon that could be extrapolated to whatever depth you wanted. I mean, it, it, uh, I guess what I would say is what really, the product here was this professional paper that documented the temperature pressure depth relationships for these 13 drill holes in, in three, at least three different hydrothermal environments. You had the classic water systems of Upper Geyser Basin, you had the vapor dominated system at Sulphur Cauldron, and then you had the, the calcium carbonate system at Mammoth. And they all gave very different uh, uh, results, but the, the thing that I would say illustrates the impact is we never got any static whatsoever on this professional paper. It was simply accepted as this is what it looks like in the upper part of high temperature hydrothermal systems end of discussion. Now with the exception of Don White's work at Steamboat Springs in Nevada, very few other areas in the world have had this sort of investigation at shallow depths. Most of the time, of course, in commercial drilling, you're trying to get through this shallow stuff just as fast as possible. You want to get down to a thousand feet in case, thank you, and then drill on to where you're going to get your production depth. 
So this was a, and is, I believe, a unique data set that is comprehensively documented, and in particularly documented not only in terms of the uh, phys physical parameters, particularly temperature and pressure, which are measured very systematically, um, but in terms of also studying the core that came out of the, the wells, that was studied extensively by, by me, uh, by Terry Keith, by Keith Barger, and a variety of other people that came in and worked on specific aspects of it. And there was a other spin-off that, that came off of this, but the real core of our results is in that uh, drilling professional paper, I think. Summarize the range of work that took place. Overall, this was a very comprehensive effort of the USGS with the financial support from NASA to develop a comprehensive understanding of Yellowstone National Park and vicinity. And it encompassed not only the study of the active processes, processes which we were involved in primarily, but worked back through the uh, glacial history, through the volcanic history, through the early volcanic history of the Absarica volcanoes, and then into the Paleozoic and Mesozoic stratigraphy and structure. It was a effort to look at this elephant from a variety of different sides and see what it really looked like. And that was the context that came to us from NASA. They obviously, although I never met any of the program managers there, they obviously looked at this from a very broad um, scientific perspective. They, they didn't have any preconceived answer that they wanted here. They were interested that if they had, had the opportunity to look at a Yellowstone on another planet, how would they interpret what they saw? And they were smart enough to know that they needed to do more than just look at the hot springs, that they needed to look at the whole Yellowstone phenomenon, if you will. Now, of course, this just spawned a tremendous amount of subsequent effort, uh, much of which turned out to be geophysical. Uh, the geophysical work uh, took off when we developed our geothermal research program in 1973 and we put a lot of money in the Yellowstone as essentially a test bed. I mean, you try things where you know there is hot water before you try it in some area where you're just looking for it. And we tried a lot of geophysical techniques up there, some of which were successful, some of which were an absolute bust. And then pretty much at the same time, Bob Smith of the University of Utah, a long time interest in Yellowstone, got involved in that uh, uh, in terms of the uh, seismology, in terms of the geodetic studies. We started finding out that the Yellowstone caldera is indeed a living and breathing thing that expands and collapses. Uh, uh, our colleague Dan Jurishin was very heavily involved in there, and there's a lot of continuing work. And then the whole question, when we go back to plate tectonics, is the fact that Yellowstone is at the head of this path of calderas that has come up the eastern Snake River Plain over the last 15 million years, with the, the head of it, if you will, being at Yellowstone right now, in fact, being in the eastern part of Yellowstone under the Sour Creek Dome. And Bob Smith has done a lot of work trying to look at the geophysical aspects of that part of Yellowstone, east of where I did any work at all, although Bob has been in there, uh, that uh, uh, trying to look for evidence of magma in there that we may be having another eruption. I mean, it would be uh, reasonable to say that if this, if this melting anomaly has been marching up the eastern Snake River Plain for 15 million years, that we're not fortuitously here when it's stopping. In other words, the chances are it's going to keep migrating to the northeast, and the question is when. Now, this is not a scare tactic. As, as we all know, that we've had three major caldera eruptions in Yellowstone separated by 600,000 years. So we're not saying, okay, next week there's going to be an, a, a caldera eruption. 
But I would be amazed over the next million years if something pretty big didn't happen up there. But that's over the next million years. How did this work draw attention to the hotspot path leading up to Yellowstone? This is one of the aspects that has evolved from the initial studies up there, that after the studies that, that Bob Christensen did at Yellowstone, people started realizing that, yes, indeed, the Yellowstone was the youngest of a series of calderas that had migrated up the eastern Snake River Plain over the past 15 million years, and that the three youngest ones are actually in the general Yellowstone area. Well, it would be a little um, fortuitous if we were living at the exact time when this particular process decided to end. So given the fact that the, the last three eruptions of the, these calderas were separated by about 730,000 years, uh, it would, it would amaze me if sometime within, say, the next million, certainly two million years, we didn't have another eruption of that sort of, of magnitude. But a million years is a long time. I don't think I'm going to make it. <laughs> How did you and your colleagues communicate your findings? Okay, you were asking what kind of documentation that we had. Well, of course, I, I do have my field books, field notebooks. I've maintained them religiously, as you saw up there. For the drilling, we kept uh, drilling log books and where we kept very close records of everything we did with the drill hole in terms of temperatures, pressures, when we pulled core, what the percentage of core recovery was, so on and so forth. And those were essential in terms of both writing the professional paper on the physical results, but also in terms of the, the studies we did on the core themselves. In terms of the bureaucracy of this, if you will, or the management, much of that was probably contained in typewritten letters that went back and forth, not between us particularly, but would be between, say, Don and the management back in Reston. And I think most of those have probably been lost in the, arch in the dusty archives of somewhere or other. Uh, we do have... Uh, uh, I still have a lot of the uh, original uh, geologic maps we did of the geyser basins. I have a, a, uh, a magnificent orthophotograph of Pocket Basin that I've never managed to finish. Uh, you know, I could spend uh, not only the, the next 10 years, but probably the next century finishing up stuff from everything that's lying around in this office. Describe Bob's Yellowstone paper that was so eagerly anticipated. Well, it was the, the, where Bob was trying to tie everything together in terms of the young volcanic geology of Yellowstone National Park and vicinity. It was intended to be a, a, if you will, a classic professional paper which dotted every I and crossed every T. Now, as it, it did take a long time to get out for a variety of reasons, which uh, really are not important. It is out, and it is an absolutely classic uh, reference document for anyone that's working in Yellowstone. Describe some of the hazards working in the park. Well, you were asking things that, that memories that come up. One that comes up to me is the fact we had grizzly bears all around us when we were drilling at Y5 in, in uh, uh, Biscuit Basin. And you'd come out in the morning and you'd have to repair your, your water lines because the grizzlies had chewed them. And you'd be standing on the drill rig and you'd be, see grizzly bears wandering around oh, 100 feet, 150 feet away from the drill rig. I mean, this was a dump we were drilling in. And gr the grizzly bears basically were attracted to the dump. Um, you got other interesting things. I was walking through the uh, Lodge Pine Woods in Lower Geyser Basin, looking down at the ground, trying to follow whether it was a came or a, or a gravel bench or till, and looked up, and, and 10 feet in front of me was a big bull bison. I looked there, and I said, good evening, and I backed up and <laughs> walked away. <laughs> you know, he was, he, if I'd have walked 10 feet further, I would have bumped noses with him, and that could be reasonably dangerous. Uh, 
we, uh, the only time we were really ever chased by any animals was in elk, elk birthing season. And for a few days there, the female elk got very, very aggressive about protecting the, the newborn. And Alfred and I, uh, no, Mel Beeson and I, had some real problems with that one day. We just happened to stumble into things when there was uh, uh, some problems and had to go way around to get away from these guys. Oh, what else? I'm sure Bob and Chris will come up with other things, but you've got to remember that you know, I'm working on memories now that are uh, 43 years ago, and a lot of water has gone under the bridge, and uh, there's, it's kind of hard to remember what some of the details were other than the generalities. This clearly was an extremely exciting time for all of us involved up there uh, we were really very privileged to have this opportunity.